Well, hello, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Thanks for joining me again this Wednesday for our continued Bible study in the book of James. This is actually our 10th week in this study. We're taking our time going through it, but we're getting close to the end. Uh, it's a five-chapter book, this uh, letter that James wrote. And uh, today we're going to be looking at uh, the beginning of chapter 4. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. So we're getting close and we're learning a lot. Uh, just about uh, life, you know, James is so practical. And, and every, every lesson that we study together provides us a lot of action steps. Things we can put into practice even right away. And so there'll be some more of that again today. So thanks for, for joining us for this Bible study. Uh, before we get started, though, uh, I have a little treat for you. Uh, we're going to listen to a special song by JJ. He's going to sing a song and uh, worship God with his music. And so uh, let's listen to this. Let's worship God together. If you know this song, this is uh, uh, one of those uh, oldies but goodies. It's an oldie but a goodie. And, uh, uh, and, and so you may know it. And so let's worship God together and uh, as, as JJ leads us in this song. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name? care to feel my hurt who am i that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever wandering heart not because of who i am but because of what you've done not because of what i've done but because of who you are, I am a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling, and you told me who I am. I am yours, I am yours. Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that called the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what I've done, but because of who you are. I am a flower quickly fading Here today and gone tomorrow A wave tossed in the ocean A vapor in the wind Still you hear me when I'm calling Lord, you catch me when I'm falling And you told me who I am I am yours because of who I am, but because of what you've done, not because of what I've done, but because of who you are, I 
am, a flower quickly fading, here today and gone tomorrow, a wave tossed in the ocean, a vapor in the wind, still you hear me when I'm calling, Lord you catch me when I'm falling, you told me who I am. I am yours. I am yours. I am yours. Oh. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? Cause I am yours, I am yours. Well, thank you, JJ. Great job. Whom shall I fear indeed? Praise God for that. Thank you for singing and, and leading us in that time of worshiping God. Well, today we're going to get started at this time in our study of James. And uh, the title of our lesson today is How to Avoid Arguments. How to Avoid Arguments. If there's one thing that we all need to learn to do during this age of, of divisiveness that we're in, in our country, it's how to avoid arguments. We're seeing a lot of arguing, a lot of dissension back and forth. We see it in social media. We see it in public dialogue. And so we really need to learn why it's important to avoid arguments and how to do that, how to avoid arguments. Uh, and, and it's not just in the public square, as it were. It's not just on social media. It's not just involving politics and government and things like that. But uh, it really, this is an issue that really hits home close to, uh, for all of us, because in our own families, I hear uh, from couples, uh, husband, wife, who will say, we just can't seem to get along. We love each other, but we're, we're always arguing. We, we argue so much. Why, are we, why do we have such major blow-ups, they ask themselves, over, sometimes over minor issues. Or I, I hear from parents who will say the same thing about the relationship between them and, and their children. They're like, uh, it's, there's just always this tension, this constant tension. I don't understand why I'm arguing with my kids and they, you know, they argue back and so on and so forth. Well, James talks about that. In this passage you're going to read today in James chapter 4, he gives us both the causes of arguing and the cures for arguing. And uh, as always, he doesn't beat around the bush. He gets right to the point in verse 1. Uh, I mean, he, again, he's just so practical. Long before, you know, modern psychology came along, he already had some profound insights that came from the Lord, came from the Holy Spirit uh, on the cause of conflict. So look at verse 1. This is uh, James chapter 4, verse 1. Again, you can follow the notes on, on the tab, uh, one of the tabs. It says notes. Uh, and uh, the other one, you can follow the scriptures. So uh, James 4.1 reads like this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires at battle within you? Now right away, using these two questions, he tells us a lot. He tells us that the cause of arguments is conflicting desires. Conflicting desires. When my wants conflict with your wants then the sparks are going to fly. Now, conflict actually starts very early in life. Uh, did you know even before you could talk, you uh, already were um, in the middle of, of conflict with your, with your parents? Have you noticed that, that a baby, even uh, babies, you know, when are toddlers, uh, even before they're, they're toddlers, before they can walk, uh, if their needs are not met instantly, then they let you know in very uncertain terms. Uh, children learn to argue before they learn to talk. They already are making their, uh, their needs known, their desires known. Now, another area that we see this a lot is in marriage. Um, my wife, in, in our years of being married, uh, not only in our own experience, but also through 
premarital counseling that we do with young couples there that are about to, to be married. Uh, this is an area that we, we talk about. And uh, in fact, uh, the couples that we counsel, we offer premarital counseling, uh, we have them take an, an inventory, what's called an inventory. It's an assessment of, of their relationship, kind of an x-ray of their relationship. And uh, it's pretty deep. It goes into their background. It goes into their family background. It goes into their upbringing. It goes into their values and how their parents handled money and how that compares, how their family ha- handled conflict. Uh, what was their parents' arguing style? And uh, so all this, they answer all these questions and it comes back and we look at it we, and, and we look at the report and think, man, you know, it's, it's, it's like marriage, marriages are, are, have these built-in conditions for conflict. Uh, you know, there, there are things we also talk about expectations between the husband and the wife to be and the expectations the husband has for the wife and vice versa. And we think, wow, there's going to be some conflict. Now, this is, you know, this is. Uh, this is the way it is, and it's common, it, it's normal. Uh, all of us were that way before we got married. We we're idealistic and unrealistic in some areas. And uh, boy, what a rude awakening when uh, we found out that it was going to be that way. But So there are conflicting desires, is what I'm saying, and frustrated feelings that cause arguments. Now, the Bible makes it clear here and in other places that there are three basic desires that we all have that cause conflict. Now, these are legitimate desires. These are not wrong desires unless we let them get out of control. In fact, these are God-given desires. But when we put these desires above people, then that's when they cause conflict. And so we're going to talk about these desires. And uh, this is going to be a two-parter. There's so much to cover that I didn't want to cover all of it uh, tonight. So next week, we're going to talk about how to avoid arguments Part two. Uh, So what are these God-given desires that we have that uh, tend to cause conflict when we let them uh, get out of control? The first one is the desire to have. The desire to have. Verse two reads like this. You desire, but you do not have. So you kill. Uh, You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Okay, so he says you desire but do not have. Uh, So the first desire is the desire to have. We want to have things. We call this materialism, uh, having possessions, because God created things for us to enjoy. Uh, There are certain things that God created for us to to use them for our pleasure. That's what they're there for. We we use things and we love people. That's really the equation. We use things and we love people. The problem is when we start loving things. Now we think, well, I can love things and love people too, but that never works out that way. Once we start loving things, then we get the equation backwards and, and eventually it'll lead to us using people. We start loving things and using people, manipulating people, controlling people, moving them around to get what you want because things, possessions, uh, become the most important thing in your life. Status. So it's very easy to fall in love with things these days, with all the TV commercials, with all the targeted ads. You know, now the, the age of the internet uh, ads are targeted uh, to your specific desires. How do, how do people know that? How do companies and advertisers know that? Well, they're listening into your conversations and they know what you've clicked on when you're doing some uh, shopping on, online. And so then all the, ta- all the ads you see are targeted just for you. They have your name on them, so to speak. And so we desire it. I mean, do you, do you get online like I do and like, you see an ad, that, like I said, it's been targeted toward you, and you're like, man, I'd love to have that. Wow, that looks good. And uh, so the desire to have becomes the most important thing in your life, or it becomes more important than it should be, it becomes more important than your relationship with your spouse or whomever it might be, and that begins to create conflict. So it's not, uh, you know, by accident that Gallup says that 56% of all marriages 
that end in divorce, uh, end in divorce because of money problems, because things, possessions become a battleground. So we've got to learn to deal with a desire to have, the desire to have. If you decide to base your life on what you have and compare it to what other people have, you know, the old keeping up with the Joneses, then you'll never be happy because no matter how much you get, somebody will always have more. Always. Uh, just about the time you catch up with the Joneses, they refinance their house and they're able to move into a, a, a bigger house. I mean, there's always something more. So the desire to have causes conflict. The second one that uh, James talks about is the desire to feel the desire to feel. He says this in, in verse 3. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. That you may spend what you get on your pleasures. So this is a desire to feel because we all want to feel good. We all want to live comfortably and feel comfortable. We want to have our not just our desires met, but our senses satisfied. You want to you wanna have a good house because you want to feel good. You want to you wanna have, you know, whatever possessions it might be, whatever status in the community you want to enjoy because you want to feel good. This is a desire to feel. Uh, now, it's not wrong to, to enjoy life, as I said, but when pleasures become the number one goal in your life, when a desire to, to feel and to enjoy a pleasure, to enjoy a possession, to enjoy a status in your community, among your circle of friends, when that becomes the most important thing, then you're asking for conflict. You're asking for conflict. It's going to cause problems in your life. Uh, here's what uh, 1 Timothy 6.17 says. Listen to this. Or follow along. Look it up quickly here in the Bible tab. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. So again, it's not wrong to enjoy life. God provides things for you to enjoy life. Just don't get the equation turned around. Don't make the desire to feel good about those things, about enjoying those things, the, the most important thing in your life. Because as I said, it's going to cause conflict. It's going to cause problems in your life. When my pleasure takes a place over what is necessary, what is needful, and I'm more interested in my pleasure and feeling good, you know, it feeling pleasurable, then uh, I'm asking for trouble. Uh, if I'm more interested in my comfort than I am in the comfort of somebody else, than I am in the comfort of the family and whole uh, as a whole, or in the comfort of my spouse. Uh, and, and all I think about is what makes me feel good. These clothes make me feel good. You know, this neighborhood makes me feel good. Then that's going to cause problems because a desire to feel good creates conflict. So the desire to have and the desire to feel good are two of the desires that uh, that can cause conflict. The third one is the desire to be, the desire to be. In other words, we're talking about pride. We're talking about power. We're talking about prominence, popularity. We're talking about, I want to be known. If, if possible, I want to be the most important one. I can, be, you know, it come, you have a conversation and somebody says, oh, I had this surgery. Well, I can beat that. I had this surgery. Or, you know, my, my family... Uh, Somebody has COVID. Well, we, there are two in my family that have COVID. You know, it's a desire for me first. And really, um, children, we know that children do this. Sorry, I'm just responding to my wife sending me a text. Uh, we know that children do this. Uh, little kids say, watch me, daddy. Watch me, mommy. And they're showing off something they can do. We as adults do this all the time. We, we do this, but we do it in subtle ways. We, we say, watch me, everybody, watch me. And the way we do that so subtly is we say, watch me by the way I dress. 
Watch the way, watch the dress and the attire I'm wearing. Watch me by the kind of clothes that I'm buying and wearing. Watch me by the kind of car that I drive. Watch me by the furniture in my house. You know, it's a desire to impress. This is a desire that uh, it's because of, of pride, really, to, to be number one to impress. And uh, the, the problem is, is pride. The problem is pride. Look at uh, Proverbs 13.10. Proverbs 13.10. Pride only breeds quarrels. Pride only breeds quarrels. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. So pride is, is going to breed quarrels. That's what it's going to lead to. Watch me. Watch, watch how, you know, the neighborhood. Again, I said this early neighborhood I live in. And there's nothing wrong with. This is what Paul, what, not Paul, what uh, James was saying. There's nothing wrong with the things that God has given you to enjoy. But when you let pride take over, this is what causes the conflict. Pride only breeds quarrels. I mean, that's so simple. So simple. Why is that true? You know, I'm too proud to compromise and that causes conflicts. I'm, I'm too proud to admit that I was wrong. Have you ever been in that situation where you're having an argument and then you realize and maybe even knew beforehand that you were wrong, but you don't want to admit it? Why? Because of pride. Pride causes arguments. And this is a bottom line of all these things. And so you know, next time you're in an argument like that and uh, you realize you're wrong, I mean, don't, don't keep arguing. Is it really worth it to keep arguing, to create that conflict? It's just admit you're wrong. Now, again, verses, verses 2 and 3, one more time. Let's go back over these. Verse, verses 2 and 3. You desire but do not have, so you kill. He's not talking about uh, literally. Uh, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now here James is telling us two reasons why our desires aren't fulfilled. Number one, he says we don't pray. We don't pray. We don't ask God, which means that we're looking to the wrong source to meet our needs. We look to uh, our own ability or we look to others to other people to fulfill our needs instead of looking to God who, who says, I'll meet your needs if you will pray, if you will ask me. And then he says that when we do pray, we usually pray with the wrong motive. We ask for things in a selfish way. Now, we already read that everything that I need, uh, you know, God has promised to provide and that he provides things for our enjoyment. We know that's true. We read that time and again in the scriptures. He'll meet our desires to have. He'll, he'll meet our desires to be. He'll meet our desires to feel. We want to feel important. Of course we do. We all want to feel important. But he'll meet those desires if we ask in prayer, not if we go out and try to get those things on our own in pride and in doing so cause conflict in our relationships. But uh, some people would rather fight than pray. Some people would rather argue about something than to go to the Lord for that something they're arguing about, for the answer. So let me ask you this question. What have you been arguing about lately that God would give you if you only asked him? But you haven't asked them. Instead, you're arguing about it and you're causing conflict instead of just trusting God for it. You know, maybe there are people out there. And in fact, I know there are people who are arguing uh, politically and they're arguing about good things. Maybe they're arguing about biblical values, family values, uh, you know, whatever the terminology might be they're, But they're arguing politically about those things. Because they haven't really trusted God. It's like, God, we have to have this, this happen. We have to have this law passed. And God says, just ask me. Just ask me. You don't have to argue about it politically when I want to give it to you supernaturally. Just trust in me. And, and I think if we learn to trust God to fill in the gaps 
and instead of arguing about it and, and sometimes even giving up some of the biblical values because we think we, we have to provide it, uh, you know, if we just trust God, he'll fill in the spiritual gaps that exist in our nation. That's, that's just kind of a, uh, you know, a, a cultural thing that's going on. People arguing, voting politically, but not trusting God to accomplish those things without their arguments. But it happens, in, again, in our personal relationships as well. So James says we'd have a lot more peace if we just prayed more, if we prayed about things instead of arguing about them. We'd have a lot more peace in our relationships, uh, in our marriages, in our homes, at our jobs. Because how many of you know there's conflict uh, at work? There's drama at work. Uh, if, if we would just fight less and pray more, it would be less conflict. You know that old song, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. You know that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. And so if we just carry it to God in prayer. We don't have to deal with the conflict and the pain that comes with that. Now, in the next verses, uh, James talks about conflict with God. Pride not only causes conflict with other people, but it causes conflict with God. So verse 6 says this, look at verse 6, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And he's quoting a scripture from Proverbs, Proverbs 3, 4. God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Have you noticed that, that God has a very unique way of orchestrating circumstances to pop our pride? Just about the time you think, okay, I've got it all together, man, things, everything I've wanted and I've worked for and I've argued, you know, I've fought for, now I've, I've, I've got it all in place. And uh, just when we think we've got it all in place, then he puts us in our place uh, because we're basically acting as if we don't need him by our lack of prayer, by our lack of trusting him to, as I said, to fill in the gaps. We're always going to have gaps in our lives, things that are not working out. We have gaps. You have gaps in your life. We have gaps in our, in, in our relationships. You've got gaps in your marriage. Uh, we've got plenty of gaps in our country, in our culture. Uh, but God can fill in those gaps better than we can uh, by acting as if we don't need God. So uh, just about the time you think I've got it together, he, he says, no, you don't. He pops our pride. And we, re we realize that we have been in opposition to God all this time. In opposition to God. And you know what? To be in opposition to God is a dangerous place to be. Do you really want to be on a collision course with God? Do you? Do you really want to be opposed to God? Now, we think sometimes, well, it's a people out in the world. It's a people that are living in rebellion uh, against God who are not living their lives based on, on the scriptures. The people who have not surrendered their lives to God, they're the ones who are opposed to God and uh, James is saying, no, no. If, if you're living your life with pride and, and, and one of the um, symptoms of that, one of the things that lets us know we're living that way is a constant conflict, the arguing that goes on that just tells us that we're, we're filled with pride. Then God says, you may not be out there in the world, so to speak, but you're opposed to me. And what a, that's a terrible place to be. There's no way you're going to win if, um, if you're opposed to God. And so pride is a cause of many arguments. And that's the case that James is making. Now, if that's a case that James is making, what's a cure? What's a cure? Well, the cure, and, and we're going to talk about this next week. The cure is humility. If pride is the cause of many arguments. The cure is humility. This is why verse 6 says, but he gives us more grace. 
This is, that is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. So humility is the opposite of pride. And so next week, we're going to continue this talking about humility and grace. If you notice at the beginning of verse 6, he talks about grace. Uh, but today we just need to recognize what is causing the dissension, the divisiveness, the arguing, the conflict. It's pride. And um, what the Bible tells us to do is not to ask God. Bible doesn't tell us to ask God to humble us. You can ask God that, but uh, I wouldn't do it because <laughs> he, he, he can definitely do that. And he has done that. But the Bible teaches us to humble ourselves. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, is what the scriptures say. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he might exalt you, that he might lift you up in due time. So today, uh, as we conclude uh, this time of study, let's, let's humble ourselves. Let's humble ourselves uh, in prayer, as we surrender ourselves to God, let's humble, our, humble ourselves by recognizing that we've been wrong. If indeed we've been the ones and our attitude has been the one that has caused the conflict. It's, a, it's an attitude of me first. It's an attitude of, uh, you know, I just I just want to I just want to have certain possessions that everybody else in my circle has. And I just want to feel important. I just want to be you know, important, a desire to have, the desire to feel, the desire to be. And uh, let's instead say, God, I'm just going to trust you. Forgive me for my pride. Forgive me for my part of causing conflict, my part of not trusting you and, and causing arguments. And uh, as we continue to, to read this and study this next week, we're, we're going to see how God shows us a way. To move forward. I mean, you don't have to wait till next week. Read it. It's, it's right there. And again, uh, James is very clear. Paul has a way of writing that his sentences are, are long and they're, uh, they're not, I don't want to say they're complicated, but they're, you know, uh, they're involved. There are various layers. And I love to study Paul's writings because you have to unravel his thoughts. And it, to me, it's exciting. exciting. But, but James is just very clear and direct. And so you can finish reading uh, the rest of this passage. But right now, let's just go to the Lord in, prayer, Lord in prayer and ask him for his help. Would you pray with me at this time? Father, we just come before you today, Lord. And we're so grateful for the time we've been able to enjoy together as a, as a family, as a group of friends. Thank you for everyone who's taking the time to set things aside today and to study together. And Lord, we're so grateful for the clarity of your word and the power to speak to our hearts and to stir us. What we read uh, every time that we come together on Sundays or on Wednesdays or any other time that we might get together, what we read is not just a man-made or man-written book, but this is your word and we can tell not just in the clarity of the, of the principles, but in the power to change us. And so, God, uh, I, along with others, ask for forgiveness for the times that I allowed these desires you have given me, desires to have and to feel and to be, they're, they're given to us and given to, to me by you, but, uh, Lord, I've let them occasionally get out of control. Forgive me for that, Lord. Forgive me for the times that uh, I argued unnecessarily, that I argued because of pride. And today, Father, I want, I want to learn to live humbly because I don't want to be opposed to you. No, I don't. But instead, I want to be uh, the recipient of your grace in this area. So help us all to do that. Bless every person that is uh, listening and watching today. Bless their families. Bless their marriages. Let their marriages be blessed and let them be strong. Let there be peace in their homes. Let there be joy in their homes. Father, we pray uh, for our country. We need an intervention of your Holy Spirit. We trust your God that, that you would move and that you would bring a a revival in which people would recognize their need of you. 
we know that these are signs of the times. We know that certain things are, are going to happen. But in the midst of the, the bad and terrible things that are happening, that you would raise up a group of people who love you and serve you and who continue to love their neighbors to bring them also into the fold. Bless our country. Bless our homes. Bless our church, and not only our church, but all the churches in our city, in our state, in our country, in the world that are doing your work, preaching your word, and reaching the lost, Father. Thank you for this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, thank you for joining me to, today. Uh, this Sunday, we're going to continue uh, the sermon series that we started this past week. And uh, the sermon series is titled, Free Indeed. And it's a series based on the words of Jesus in John chapter 8. Uh, this last week, we talked about uh, how he gives us uh, the, the power, rather, to be free uh, from yesterday's pain. This coming Sunday, we're going to talk about being set free from today's pressure. How many of you are under pressure, under stress? We're going to talk about how to be free from that. And then next week, uh, we'll talk about being set free from tomorrow's pessimism. So join me this Sunday at 1030 online. If you can uh, come and join us in person, if you feel comfortable, we're taking the necessary precautions, having the, uh, our meeting place uh, cleaned and sanitized and, um, you know, providing masks and, and hand sanitizer and, you know, the social distancing that is so important. Uh, so if you feel comfortable, join us. But if not, join us online at 1030 and let's worship God together and continue to draw close to him as we study his word and as we worship him together. So again, thanks for joining me. Have a, a great Wednesday night and uh, a, a blessed rest of the week. And I'll be looking for you either online or in person Sunday morning. God bless you.